Let's take a look at the case against the claim that cognition penetrates perception. I want to step back here for a second and ask the question, how might we distinguish belief or knowledge from perception? And rather than looking at various proposals that people have tried to offer on the basis of guesswork or intuition, as it's sometimes called, I think we might look at the way <clears throat> that researchers have responded when this was for them a practical problem in the course of doing some experiments. So there's a psychologist called Burke who introduced us to something called the tunnel effect. And the way that Burke explains it appeals to exactly this idea of the cyclist. So there is the cyclist who's cycling along uh, a, row, a road uh, lined with trees. And you're at some angle to the cyclist, and so you see the cyclist cycling along the road. But actually the sensory information arriving at you is fragmented because of the trees, which are mostly obscuring the cyclist. So what Burke asked was very simple. Consider the view that the cyclist is moving continuously along the road. So it's not that the cyclist is stopping and then, you know, another cyclist is popping out from behind the tree to simulate the movement of a single cyclist. There's one cyclist who's moving that way along the road. The view that that's the case, the one cyclist view, is that merely a matter of belief or knowledge based on past experience? Or is the continuity of movement actually seen by the observer? Now, Burke was writing quite a while ago, as you can see here, this is something published in uh, 1952, a classic paper. And at that time in 1952, I think most people would have antecedently thought, this is merely belief and knowledge. Perception is focused really with the deliverances of the senses. When the cyclist is obscured by a tree, the senses are not capturing information from the cyclist, therefore there can be no perception. Therefore the continuity of the cyclist's movement, that cannot be a matter of perception. Burke wanted to argue for the opposite conclusion, but he also recognised that this question is seemingly absurd. On the face of it, it seems like there wouldn't be a non-controversial way to answer this question. Very difficult. Burke, what should we do? So Burke came up with a rather ingenious idea, Burke and his colleagues, I should say. And I want to show you exactly what he did um, by some videos which I've recreated. Now, these are not Burke's actual videos. These videos that I created just to illustrate the broad idea of the methods. So here's the first video. Uh, just take a look at uh, what happens here, if you would. Now, most people, when they see that video, report seeing a single continuous movement. Most people, when they see that video, report seeing a single continuous movement. Let me show you that video one more time, actually, if I can. Here it comes. Ready? All right. So there's the video with the single continuous movement. Now I'm going to show you a second video. This is video number two. Watch what happens in this case. Most people in Burke's study who saw that video reported that the movement was discontinuous in this case. That's what they said. Fair enough. So now let's think about the experiment. What was varied in this experiment? I'm going to simplify and miss out a whole load of details. The core thing that was varied was the unseen delay behind the barrier. How long did the ball stop <laughs> behind the barrier? Now, of course, the whole thing is an illusion. Uh, you know and I know that there are patterns of light on the screen and the way that Burke did it was the same things are being projected. So there is no single object and so there is no delay. Um, but we can talk in this metaphorical way as long as we're very clear that it is just a metaphor. So what's varied is how long the object stops behind the barrier. And what did Burke measure? Now you might think, well, what Burke measured was just what people said about their experiences, their introspective reports. And in a way that's true, but Burke, like any reasonable person, wouldn't trust what people say about their experiences. Why not? Well, when people talk about experience or belief or any aspect of their own minds, they're operating with a kind of model of their 
minds and of other minds, which is geared towards a whole variety of things. So it's geared towards, you know, uh, dealing with people emotionally. It has normative and regulative aspects. Uh, it's also tied up with legal practices, reward and punishment and the rest. Talk and thought about the mind has a whole range of, serves a whole range of practical purposes in everyday life. So it would be kind of ridiculous to think that people are particularly accurate when they're talking about their own thoughts or about their own perceptions any more than we would take them to be accurate when they were talking about objects around them. Of course we can't get ordinary unreflective spontaneous judgments and then think oh we're going to get some great insight into the mind. Burke is way beyond that, he's very smart. So what Burke does is he simply measures are people saying that there is a single continuous movement or are they saying that there is a discontinuity in the movement? So he's not dependent on the content of what people are saying. He's not trusting people to report correctly what they're perceiving. He is, though, trusting that people can mark some distinction or other in their experiences. So here we've got minimal dependence on people's understanding of their own minds. Can I mark a distinction between two types of experience by saying continuous in one case and discontinuous in the other? And what Burke found is that his subjects were very systematic in doing this. So they were able, uh, across different subjects, reliably to say this is continuous, this is discontinuous, in a way that gave him coherent, consistent, repeatable results. Well done, Burke. But why are we interested? Well, let me show you one more condition. I haven't explained why we're interested yet. It's a long story. Look at this. Think about what you see here. I'm not going to play that again. Of course, you can rewind. It was silly of me to play earlier the thing again. Um, you, of course, you can rewind if you, if you didn't get that. But what I want to mention here is just this. When most people saw that video, they reported continuous movement. And indeed, Burke did a series of variations across four experiments. And he reports this. Sorry, I should say, in case you haven't noticed yet, um, some people don't actually notice here. Um, the object starts off as a blue solid circle and ends up as the outline of a sort of roughly square shape uh, and that outline is different color I think it was orange sort of brownie orange I made the video myself but I'm not very good at color sorry about that okay so here's what Burke reports when there is a change in shape size or color during the period where the object is unperceived that doesn't really disturb the continuity of the movement for the most part, experiments proceed as if there were no changes at all. So people are using exactly the same delay behind the barrier to mark the difference between continuous and discontinuous. Whatever differences there are in the results, says Burke, seem to be due to chance. So what Burke has noticed here, I think, is something marvellous and very important. What Burke has noticed is that people's, people's responses to these movements whether they think of them as continuous or discontinuous, are largely unaffected by factors like a change, a marked change in the shape, size or colour of the object. What you saw just now was a blue circle entering the, entering the tunnel and a square brown outline leaving the tunnel. Now, you have excellent reason, of course, to believe that those are distinct objects. And so that if this was a real scenario and the tunnel was explored, you would expect to find the blue circle in the tunnel. Of course you would. Of course you would. That's a very sensible thing to believe. But what Burke discovered is that that belief has no bearing at all on the responses that people make. That indicates, of course, that those responses are an indicator of what they perceived rather than of what they believed. So Burke's question was, this tunnel effect, people talking about a single object moving continuously along a pathway, even though the sensory information they get from it is fragmentary, is that a matter of perception or is it a matter of belief or knowledge? And I think the reasoning goes something like this. You don't see this in the paper by Burke, but I'm, I'm sort of adding a little bit here. The reasoning goes like this. Were it a matter of belief or knowledge, a change in the object's shape, size or colour ought to have an effect on the response that someone makes. After all, that change in shape, size, colour 
gives you very compelling evidence that the object is not the same. Something that's very hard to miss from the point of view of belief. So we should expect that if this is just a matter of what you believe or know, that those bits of evidence get filtered into the judgment. But what Burke observed, and has been replicated many times since, and I think it's an interesting experiment because you can kind of see it yourself, right? You can almost see it yourself. Of course, we have to do carefully repeated measures, but you get an impression of it just by looking at those videos I showed you a moment ago. What Burke found, what's been replicated many times since, is that changes in shape, color, and size cues to the distinctness of objects make no difference at all for the impression that you get of the movement. It still appears continuous. It follows then that this is more likely to be a consequence of perception than of belief or knowledge. What a brilliant piece of reasoning. I love that piece of reasoning. So that's important for us because it suggests that there is a way in which we can distinguish belief and knowledge on the one hand from perception on another that doesn't require anybody's you know, guesswork intuitions buying into a prior theory. The theoretical background that Burke is working with is impressively minimal. He's not buying into any complicated philosophical theory. Of course, Burke and his group, he worked with uh, Michaud, they were influenced by all kinds of philosophers. They read philosophers very carefully, but they didn't make the mistake of thinking that, you know, you should first of all start with a philosophical theory and then try to build your whole research basis on the basis of the philosophical theory. They didn't do that. Minimal assumptions, very impressive. Okay, lesson one, we can distinguish perception from knowledge and belief in a systematic way using the method that Burke introduced. Very good. Lesson two, directly relevant to our issue on cognitive penetration. If cognition penetrated perception, then we would expect the belief about the change in the size, shape, color of the object to make a difference to what was perceived in this case. Strikingly, in Burke's study, this video is shown to the subjects many times, but there isn't a difference at the beginning compared to at the end, even though at some point people must have noticed what was going on. And right now I've told you I've told you that we start with a circle and we end with a square. This is good evidence that the objects are different and all the rest of it. But the perceptual impression remains unchanged. The perceptual impression remains unchanged. So this is one very nice illustration, I think, of a case where there are things that you know that are relevant to the things that you are seeing, but they're not making any difference at all to how you're perceiving them. Your perception is giving you a misleading view about the nature of the world. The idea here that there's a single object moving continuously when they're really, in practice, it's incredibly unlikely to be. Your perception's giving you a very unlikely output and it's not at all influenced by what you believe or know. So here I think we have a solid piece of evidence for the view that cognition does not penetrate perception. Now what's striking, of course, is that the particular piece of evidence that I've drawn to your attention here is one of many hundreds of demonstrations that you could take. One of many hundreds of cases where the perception provides you with an improbable or incorrect view about the nature of the world, which could in principle be connected, corrected by things that you believe or know, very obvious things, very easily, but it, it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. If we thought that cognition penetrates perception, then we ought to expect that in these cases, the perception wouldn't give you the easily corrected, misleading, improbable view about the world, but it does again and again and again in all of these cases. So this is evidence for what Jerry Fodor calls information encapsulation. As he puts it, there is in perception a radical isolation of how things look from the effects of much of what one believes. There is in perception a radical isolation of how things look from the effects of much of what one believes. That's the notion of information encapsulation. Information encapsulation, if correct, is the, is, entails that there is not cognitive penetration of perception. It's also an interesting 
doctrine because it allows us to separate in a very clear way perception from belief, knowledge and other forms of thought. It provides a clear theoretically significant distinction that we can use in developing things like the acquaintance view. If it's correct, this is actually the end. We're at the end. What we've done is we've seen that there is some evidence that cognition does not penetrate perception. And we've seen that that evidence also supports the very closely related view that perception is informationally encapsulated from thought, as Fodor puts it. Thank you very much. Now, just in case anybody wants a tiny bit more, this is highly optional. I wanted to mention as a postscript that there is a complication. And the complication arises from a distinction between two forms of cognitive penetration. So if we have synchronic cognitive penetration, what we mean is this. At any particular moment in time, you have some beliefs. For example, it was a circle, now it's a square. And those beliefs are relevant to what you perceive, but they do or don't alter the character of your perception. That's the synchronic case. And everything that we've said so far has been focused on that synchronic case. What some people have suggested, however, is that it's also possible to think of cognitive penetration as being a diachronic matter. So here the idea is something like this. You go out into the world, you do some learning, you acquire some beliefs. Over some period of time, those beliefs gradually come to inform the way that your perceptual system works. So what happens is that your beliefs have a long-term effect resulting in changes, perhaps very gradual changes, to the way that your perceptual processes work. So it's possible for all that we have said that there is such diachronic cognitive penetration. If we're being careful, all that we've been arguing about so far is the synchronic case. But the time available in this course is pretty short. The diachronic issue is a little bit more thorny. The evidence, I think, is less clear. So I'm happy to say, for our purposes, that we're just focusing on the synchronic case. Marvellous. What comes next? What a great question. Well, the thing to do now is, of course, to look at evidence for the opposite view, evidence that there is penetration of perception by cognition.